So this year there's been a lot of attention on no non 0157H7 E. coli testing, specifically in USDA related commodities, but there also has been some interest from uh, in other types of commodities as well. This presentation will focus mainly on the USDA perspective of non 0157H7 testing. For my talk today, I'm going to give some definitions about what all the different abbreviations mean and the genes and things like that. I'll be talking about the history and why we are testing at the moment. I'll briefly be talking about the different testing approaches that can detect 0157 and non 0157 STX in food, the methods, and then the challenges and what's next for this. So I'm fairly sure everyone's heard of Escherichia coli before, or otherwise known as E. coli. E. coli is a gram-negative bacteria that's associated with uh, warm-blooded animals. It's used as a sign of fecal contamination, and testing in foods is often an indicator of hygiene. Uh, there is also pathogenic E. coli, which is known as EHEC or STEC. EHEC is a clinical diagnosis of bacteria that cause bloody diarrhea and HUS. STEC is a broader category of organisms that contain sugar toxin. And the non 0157H7 STEX would fit both categories. So they're STEX and EX. <coughs> EAE is a term that comes up quite often in testing, and it's associated with the DNA, and it encodes a protein called intamin, which is associated with the virulence. STX is the sugar toxin gene, and there are two variants STX1 and STX2. And then there's another gene that's been involved in the testing protocols, and it's called WX, sorry, WZX, and that encodes the O group, which is associated with the outer membrane of the cells. And so I included a diagram of the cells, and the, uh, the O group is associated with that out, outer layer. The history leading up to the testing being implemented is that the number of 0157 illnesses are decreasing, and someone showed a diagram related to that today. However, the number of non-0157 STEC illnesses have been seen to be increasing. That's partly associated with the ability to now test for them in clinical samples. These illnesses have been largely sporadic in nature, so there haven't been a lot of large outbreaks until this year with the 014 outbreak. These cells also have a low infectious dose like 0157 and they can also cause serious disease like 0157. I saw this number while I was preparing for the presentation. I'm not quite sure how accurate it is, but the CDC estimates that perhaps 70 to 85% of cases associated with non-0157 STEX may be attributed to USDA-related products. And the top six O groups make up about 85% of the illnesses. At this time, there's only been one definitive case of a US outbreak being associated to a meat product, which was in ground beef last year. So the USDA issued a federal register notice in September this year that said that in addition to 0157H7, six other serogroups of E. coli will be considered as adulterants in raw, non-intact beef products of March 5th, 2012. And this would mean trim, ground beef, and um, blade tenderized beef products. The verification testing in March will begin with trim and then move to the other products. An adulterant, according to the USDA and the MLG method, is going to be positive for EAE, STX102, and the WZX protein. An EAE, STX positive, but a WZX negative requires reassessment of the HACCP plan. So although it won't be considered an adulterant, it will, um, there will be some questions about what to do with that product and whether it should be released. The testing protocol has been updated twice. So the MLG method was released last year and then updated in October of this year. It's available on the website for the MLG. The testing is of a 325 gram sample. And the terminology for testing is going to be a potential, presumptive, and confirmed negative or positive sample, very similar to what we see for 0157H7 currently. So potential positive is going to be a genetic positive, a presumptive is on a plate, and then a confirmed is a serological and biochemical confirmation. And I'm not going to go into this. The reason I'm showing this is to show how complicated and time-consuming the current USDA uh, protocol is. 
the uh, sample would be received on day one, it would be enriched, and the next day you would do the screen, you would know if it was a potential positive at this point, then it goes to a plate, at this point you might know if it's a um, presumptive positive, and then you go on to the serological and biochemical confirmation. So the final determination on a presumptive sample going th all the way through to a, a confirmed positive or negative is about four days. There are two screening approaches available for STEC testing at the moment. There is a PCR only approach and then there's a PCR and IMS approach. The current testing technologies are all very similar in their approaches and in the genetic targets that they test. So the basic protocol is that you would enrich the sample. You would do, uh, for a PCR only test, you do an initial PCR that might be for EAE only or for EAE and STX concurrently. That would give you a potential positive or a, uh, sorry, that would just give you a, an initial screen result. Then you can do an O-group PCR. If that tests positive, that would give you the potential positive. At this point, you've already done three or four PCR reactions. Uh, then if, if you desire, you can go on with the confirmation. Another approach uses PCR and IMS. Again, you would enrich the sample, and in this case, you would do an O-group specific IMS before proceeding with the PCR. And the idea here is that you may be able to reduce the number of potential positives going through the, the process. And then again, you do a PCR for EAE, STX, um, potentially also for the O-group, and then move on to the confirmation if desired. Uh, we're currently offering two platforms for the Shigatoxin testing of um, non-0157 STEX. There is a, assay of, a number of assays available, uh, available from Biocontrol. These samples are enriched in MEHEC and then they go through a couple of different testing uh, schemes. There's a top six kit that would only test for the non-0157 H7 STEX. And in this case, you would do an EAE screen and then an STX screen. They also have an option for top seven, which would include 0157 in this protocol as well. And they have a kit here that can do 0157, EAE, and STEC as one reaction. So one PCR instead of the two. Uh, DuPont Qualicon also offers a solution for STEC testing. And this sample, uh, in this case, samples are enriched in MTSB or their BAX media. It's very similar to the USDA protocol where you would do the initial PCR for EAE and STX. If that was initially reactive, then you would do two panels for O-group testing. So that would be three PCR reactions. And if those were pos uh, positive, you would go on with confirmation via the MLG if desired. So I just wanted to finish up by talking about some of the challenges and what we see for next year. Obviously, there's a lot of concern in industry at the moment about how this is going to be implemented and how much it's going to cost and how it's going to affect product. Uh, one thing we know that there is going to be in a cost of additional testing. Uh, the implementation of the methods is difficult, particularly the confirmation. We still don't really have a good understanding of the prevalence of false positives and how long it's going to take to weed those out. There are questions about what happens if you have a, whole, a high rate of false positives in regards to holding and diverting the product. And then if you have a high incidence of EAE and STX, uh, STX positive, what does it mean to reassess the HACCP plans and how is that going to be implemented? And in addition, uh, verifying that the interventions currently used are effective against these organisms as well.